two years ago, I started the DF Retro series with a look at Quake running on a Sega Saturn console. It was this idea that a piece of hardware so seemingly outmatched by a game could deliver such a great version that really grabbed me. I love this feeling of experiencing what feels like an impossible port. And it just so happens that this is exactly the sort of work that developer Panic Button has built its reputation on. Late last year, the team at Panic Button unleashed the Switch conversion of Doom 2016, blowing away expectations in the process. It wasn't the best version of the game by any means, but we're talking about Doom running on a mere 7 watts in the palm of your hands. And now, less than one year later, we have Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, Panic Button's latest Switch conversion. It should go without saying that this will not take the crown as the best version of the game. As with Doom, a lot of compromises have been made in bringing the game to Switch, but that doesn't change the fact that what we have here is still highly impressive. The engineers responsible for this port have done excellent work. In many ways, Wolf 2 is an interesting study in the choices made when porting a game to a less powerful platform. The goal with any conversion is usually to deliver an experience as close to the original source material as possible by making the right choices during development. Take something like FIFA Soccer on the Switch. In this case, EA opted for a different game engine entirely, with a focus on maintaining a higher resolution and frame rate. The compromises in this case come instead from missing visual details and effects. Or how about Fortnite? From Xbox One X to mobile phones, the Switch and beyond, each version of the game is focused on delivering the full Fortnite experience on each target device, no matter the visual sacrifices necessary to get there. Even if you're playing on an iPhone 6S, it's still the same basic game. And thus we come to Wolfenstein 2. With this game, Panic Button has instead focused on developing an experience that is as close as possible to the original release in terms of visual makeup and basic design. Removing things like volumetric lighting, ambient occlusion, per object motion blur, and dynamic lighting could have sped things up rendering wise, but it would come at the expense of its visual identity while chopping up stages into smaller chunks could have destroyed the pacing. Thankfully, design-wise, the development team has managed to successfully translate every single map to the Switch version. That's right, every stage is presented in its entirety. No cuts were made to level design, and every gameplay sequence, no matter how demanding, is presented in full. This is perhaps the single most important element to consider, and Panic Button has managed to pull it off. That's not to say some tweaks weren't made along the way, however. Here's an example. This area, featured at the beginning of the New York mission, features a nice view of the wreckage from which you've emerged, at least in the original release of the game. You see on Switch, a new wall has been erected in this spot instead, presumably to reduce load when looking back towards this area of the stage. It's a trick we've seen for generations, and one that ties into the beginning of this video. You see Quake on Sega Saturn uses this trick as well. This area on the PC version is wide open normally, but on Saturn, the wall was extended to improve performance. It's the same basic idea. So, if the game itself is intact then, what changes were necessary to run it in the first place? Well, when you think about it, Wolf 2 poses an interesting question. Basically, what if the importance of resolution was tossed aside and freed up GPU resources were instead poured into other areas? Wolf 2 just happens to answer this question in a rather interesting way. This might just be the lowest resolution game of the generation thus far, but the how and why is certainly worth exploring. You see, for starters, like Doom, Wolf 2 utilizes an adaptive resolution feature which adjusts pixel count based on load. We pixel counted a wide variety of shots and came up with a whole host of results. We saw everything ranging from a top end of 720p to 1216 by 684 to 540 and 432p, all the way down to 640 by 360, all in docked mode. When played in portable mode then, 768 by 432 and 640 by 360 are extremely common pixel counts, but it certainly does increase from there depending on load. In general, it's comparable to the Switch version of Doom, but seems to scale towards the low end more often. This is a very blurry game, but that's not the end of it. You see, I noticed some additional artifacts while examining the game closely. 
If you look here, you can see stipling and other artifacts typically associated with reconstruction. So what does this mean then? Well, it's difficult to nail down, so I don't want to speak definitively on it, but it would seem as if the game is making use of some sort of reconstruction in addition to dynamically altering pixel counts. Perhaps they're just reconstructing from a dynamic low-res buffer? Or maybe something more like the MSAA trick employed by Rainbow Six Siege? Or maybe something else entirely? Either way, the artifacts are clear and demonstrate that there is some very clever techniques happening here. It's a smart way to approach the problem that likely frees up a lot of GPU resources as needed. The question then is, how does it actually look while playing? When using the docked mode on a 55 inch 4K TV, I did find the game to be exceptionally blurry. The strong temporal anti-aliasing combined with the low rendering resolution makes it seem as if depth of field is always active. This is definitely one of those games that benefits from playing on a lower resolution, smaller display. Which is why handheld mode is pretty convincing. While it does still appear soft, the small size of the screen and lower pixel resolution allow for a more attractive overall image here. It's perhaps the best looking handheld shooter I've played to date, which says a lot. Ultimately, image quality wise, Panic Button seems to be pulling out every trick in the book here. There have been a lot of innovations in terms of image treatment this generation and Wolf 2 puts many of them to use in such a way that it actually works. But there's a lot more to discuss here than just image quality. Wolfenstein 2 offers most of the visual features present in the original release, but each of these effects has been optimized to work best on the Switch platform. For starters, when installed to your Switch console, Wolf 2 requires just 21 gigabytes of storage space. In comparison, the original console release is closer to 50 gigabytes. There's a huge savings there, and I'd imagine a lot of it comes down to these few changes. The first of these changes I noticed is a reduction in video quality. Story sequences are told using pre-rendered Bink videos. On Switch, image quality takes a noticeable hit with additional macro blocking and other artifacts present in each video, in addition to a lower overall resolution. Now on the PC, these video files only account for 7.72 gigabytes of space out of 48 gigabytes. So while the reduction on Switch may free up some space, it's not likely that this is the source of the smaller overall file size. Instead, I think the large savings stem primarily from a reduction in asset quality, specifically textures. Wolfenstein 2 is a memory hungry game and this is due in part to its efficient handling of asset streaming. On PC, for instance, you can increase or decrease the available memory the game can access for this function via the image streaming option. On Switch, however, where memory and processing power is more limited, Panic Button has seen fit to reduce overall texture resolution across the board, while also using a low level of texture filtering in general. What this means for the players then is simple. Texture detail is pared back significantly compared to other versions of the game. This is most obvious in high detail areas such as this. At a glance, the scene looks comparable, but if you start analyzing smaller bits of detail scattered across the scene, you can start to see the sacrifices that have been made on this version of the game. The same is true of this scene. When the milkshake Nazi asks you for your papers, he may not have been expecting something as illegible as this. Really though, it's most distracting when focusing on near field objects, such as the visible weapon and arm model. These are on screen throughout the majority of the game, and the reduction in quality is certainly obvious and does detract slightly from the presentation. That said, while it's true that overall detail is greatly reduced across the board, the variety of textures remain the same, and this is key when it comes to maintaining the original look of the game. You'll notice a loss in detail when viewing objects up close, but at a distance, the lower overall screen resolution of the Switch version kind of helps sidestep the issue. On a related note, I will say that the choice of game card is disappointing in this case if you want to buy the physical version. Panic Button did a great job of reducing the overall file size by more than 25 gigabytes, yet if you purchase that retail version of Wolfenstein 2, it's been suggested that you'll need to download a portion of the game to even play it. I understand the need for cost savings, of course, but I feel that this game should have shipped on a 32 gigabyte card. At the very least, perhaps this would have allowed the team to utilize higher quality Bink videos, 
assuming that storage space was the limiting factor there. On the flip side, while texture detail has taken a noticeable hit, geometry detail remains very similar across the board. Wolf 2 is extremely heavy on Geo, with some of the most richly detailed environments I've seen this generation. Aside from the addition of things like the New York wall I mentioned earlier, I also noticed little details like this. These ship windows here on the upper deck are open on Xbox One, but here on the Switch, they've been closed. Little tricks like this are used to reduce the amount of visible geometry in various scenes throughout the game without greatly impacting overall visual quality. Even when exploring the large open city environments, you're still seeing the same rich geometry as the original release. So really, in terms of overall scene complexity then, we're looking at roughly the same base geometry with more aggressive LOD management, a reduction in texture quality, and some tweaks made to the world design. I'd say that's quite a success, as the team was able to retain the complete levels here, including the geometry, which is quite an impressive thing indeed. But there are other elements to discuss in the rendering pipeline, and many of them have been adjusted for the Switch. Ambient occlusion appears to be using a lower bit depth, exhibiting noticeable artifacts in the form of stipling and vertical lines. It still gets the job done, but produces an overall dirtier image. Shadow quality is also pared back significantly across the board, thanks to a decrease in shadow resolution. Both dynamic and fixed shadows appear blurry and lacking in detail on the Switch. You can really see this when walking down the street of the town here. Shadow detail is lower overall, and you can clearly see the point where the cascade flips between the different quality levels. So yeah, in the case of direct and ambient shadowing, the Switch is certainly pared back compared to the other versions. But despite this loss in quality, it's still great to see all these features have been retained. As cutting back on shadows or removing contact shadows could have been more detrimental to the overall look of the game. The next key element brought over from the original version are the particles. Most impressively, a GPU particle system was written for this game specifically, and it was designed to enhance effects such as this. I'd say the Switch version stacks up well against the original release. On the other hand, alpha effects like fire and explosions appear to have been reduced somewhat in quality, similar to what we saw in Doom. Wolf 2 also makes extensive use of per pixel motion blur, which is featured on Switch as well. The catch here is that while it's far more noticeable at 30 frames per second and kind of looks better as a result, the method used for rendering the motion blur doesn't always play nicely with the reconstruction method that I think they're using here. You can see the artifacts here. The last key feature included in the Switch version then is volumetric lighting. Volumetric lighting is used in abundance throughout the game to help build atmosphere. The appearance of sunlight filtering through a window into a dusty room is perfectly executed, and thankfully this effect is present across each version of the game. On Switch, the resolution of the voxel grid appears to have been reduced though, which results in minor artifacting throughout the image, but the overall effect is retained which is key. So in terms of overall visual makeup then, the main rendering features offered by id Tech 6 are present and accounted for. The same lighting solution is used across all versions. Particles and effects are retained. Volumetric lighting is in. And direct and indirect shadowing is present. It may be soft and feels somewhat imprecise overall, but this is the complete Wolfenstein 2 experience running on a portable console. Of course, as you may have guessed, not every visual feature has made the cut here. For one thing, unlike Doom, Wolf 2 makes use of water in several different areas throughout the game. Bodies of water in Wolfenstein 2 make use of a real 3D mesh which interacts with the player in addition to exhibiting proper water caustics and sometimes a nice depth fog used to help give it that murky appearance. It really looks phenomenal, I think. On Switch, the 3D water mesh is maintained but the quality of the rendering has been reduced. Caustics, for instance, are completely absent in the Switch version of the game. And if we jump over to Xbox One X again, you can see that caustics are restored in addition to other effects. It just looks more natural. 
Running through water no longer produces ripples as we saw in the original version. If we run in and out of the water here on Xbox One X then, ripples are formed. Same for when you shoot it in fact, where they just use textures instead. And of course, screen space reflections are disabled entirely. When you combine these elements, you're left with something that no longer really sits naturally within the environment. It's not bad, mind you, but you can see that they really had to make a lot of compromises here with the water. I should also note that screen space reflections are absent across the board. Cube maps are still included at least, and active in both docked and handheld mode, but the real-time SSR from the surrounding environment got the axe, just as we saw in Doom. Those are really the main features missing from the Switch version, however which isn't a huge issue I'd say since water doesn't show up that often and SSR as nice as it can be doesn't exactly ruin the look of the game when it's missing. So now that we've established that most of the rendering feature set is included, we need to talk about performance. Wolfenstein 2 is a 60 frames per second game on Xbox and PS4, but it's only the supercharged PS4 Pro and Xbox One X that are able to successfully maintain it most of the time the base systems dip below 60 FPS on a fairly regular basis. So it should come as no surprise then that the Switch version targets 30 FPS instead, just like Doom. With the lower average performance of the game on other consoles, however, I kind of went into this expecting the worst. Thankfully, it seems that Panic Button has pulled off a bit of a miracle here. Throughout most of the game, Wolfenstein 2 does a great job maintaining the target 30 FPS, and most of the time, it maintains even frame pacing as well. When combined with the excellent per pixel motion blur, the game manages to look surprisingly fluid during gameplay. More importantly, the frame rate is steadier than Doom on average. Most scenes successfully maintain 30 frames per second, with moderately heavy battles exhibiting minor frame rate and frame time inconsistencies. During the first half of the game, it's remarkably stable. And what's great is, if you go back to some of the older videos of this game pre-release, the frame rate was pretty bad even early in the game, but with the final version, all of that's been cleaned up. I almost wonder if the reconstruction technique that I think is in use here was implemented at a later time in development, and that is responsible for clearing up some of the performance issues. Just a theory. That said, even in the finished version, that doesn't mean there aren't problem areas. Once I reached New Orleans, things started to take a dive. This is one of the most visually complex areas in the game, and on Switch, the resolution drops very low and it stays there throughout this section. The long draw distance and detailed environments become exceptionally blurry and performance begins to falter. The battle outside on the streets here, for instance, exhibits drops reminiscent of the worst parts of Doom. It never becomes unplayable, mind you, but the combination of low image quality and an unsteady frame rate make for a rather unpleasant time overall. Of course, keep in mind that this is the worst case scenario that I've found personally, and it does not represent the overall experience on average. Thus, for most of the game, I'd say that we're really looking at a mostly locked 30 frames per second with a few wobbles here and there. It's only during a couple larger battles that the frame rate issues really begin to crop up. Now, when in portable mode, the results are a little less stable, but it's still quite good. The average resolution remains lower than in docked mode, and the performance is less fluid, but thanks to the small size of the screen, it does at least manage to look and feel satisfying. Unfortunately, there is one other small side effect of targeting 30 frames per second. Hidden within the central hub of the game is an arcade machine, with a version of Wolfenstein 3D. It's a neat way to re-experience Wolf 3D, and in its original form, it works really well. Over on the Switch, however, it seems that cutting the frame rate in half has had a negative impact on Wolf 3D. Basically, rather than dropping frames, the game speed is simply sliced in half, so Wolf 3D runs 50% slower on the Switch than it does anywhere else. I suppose it's still playable, but the loss in speed is significant and makes for a less enjoyable game. Now, it's just a bonus game, of course, but it's disappointing that what could have been an official version of Wolfenstein 3D on a mobile platform currently doesn't play properly. Just something to keep in mind if you were looking forward to playing it. 
As a curious aside, the pixel art graphics in this version of Wolf 3D also highlight what appear to be the reconstruction artifacts. Interesting. Beyond the visual performance then, it's also worth noting that loading times are actually comparable to other versions of the game. They're not quick if you load a saved game, mind you, but story sequences are used to hide them while playing through the main campaign, so they're not a real issue normally. They also solved a tiny issue I had with the Xbox One version. When you end a level in that version, you get this pause where the screen sort of freezes up before the video plays. On Switch, this doesn't happen at all. Now, this is a very minor thing, but it's just something that always bugged me about the original release, so I'm glad to see it fixed. It also feels as if the difficulty level has been tweaked in this version. Wolf 2 in its original form can be a frustrating game with some uneven difficulty spikes at points. On Switch, this appears to have been smoothed out somewhat. Scenes that I found previously annoying were a lot less so on the Switch. Things such as this courthouse battle. Now, of course, it's possible that my prior knowledge of the game may have helped here, so I can't say for sure, but it does feel more refined overall. I'll be interested to see how others feel when they get their hands on this version. Ultimately, though, I find this to be an utterly fascinating port. Yes, it's true, a lot of compromises have been made. Image quality is poor, and plenty of effects and assets have been reduced in quality, but when you stop and consider what it's running on, it's really difficult not to be impressed. In fact, looking back at everything we've discussed in this video, I think Panic Button's approach to rendering resolution is perhaps the most fascinating and appropriate thing for this release. I say that because the game itself was designed by Machine Games, right? A studio founded by members of Starbreeze, the group responsible for The Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay, back on the original Xbox. Why is that relevant in a video about Wolfenstein 2? Well, Butcher Bay just happens to be the very first game I can recall utilizing an adaptive resolution feature. At the time, I really had no idea what was going on. It was more pixelated than any other Xbox game, and it seemed to change a lot per scene. But now we know that it was a clever trick designed to free up GPU resources for other tasks, enabling visuals beyond what you might have expected on an original Xbox. And with Wolfenstein 2, we're seeing the fruits of those labors started so many years ago come to fruition today. Like Riddick, the Switch version of Wolf 2 can drop to very low resolutions, but these techniques have enabled a visually rich game like this to exist on a 7 watt portable system, which I think is something to be celebrated. And hopefully, despite the cuts, I hope this video has helped you better appreciate what the development team has achieved here. We're talking about a console that, when in portable mode, is closer to a last generation machine than a PlayStation 4, at least in terms of pixel pushing grunt. And it's running one of the most technically impressive games released in the past few years. The Switch is certainly utilizing a more modern GPU and has access to a lot more memory than the Xbox 360, but a port like this remains no easy task, and it's a lot better than many of the cross-generation games we saw early in this generation. Still, if you're throwing down cash to buy this version of the game, you should at least know what you're getting into, and hopefully by now, you have a better idea. That's all for the moment though. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to help us out, and follow us on Twitter if you want to chat. But until next time, this is John, signing off.